Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this one of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And this is... This is why we live up here. The mountains are just so beautiful. I mean, the days are crisp, but bright and warm, and the sun feels good. The nights are chilly. You need plants that also enjoy this type of environment. So this is such a good time. This is really important for you folks new, uh, have a new house. You're thinking of landscaping, but you're not quite sure what to do or when to do it. You're, you're from other areas, and when do I garden? What do I do? This is just a tremendous time to add evergreens into your landscape because that's really the foundation of every garden. Every landscape should have at least 25% evergreens in their landscapes. And it's a great time to place them because you can see where they go. The leaves are starting to drop. We're starting to see some bare leaves. So trees are like the uh, uh, Japanese maples. They're done. Uh, the the other types of the larger maples, the, the blaze, armstrongs, fantasy maples, they're starting to finish up. The raywood ash has just started to turn that purple. The Arizona ash, one that's native, it's got a beautiful gold like aspens. They're starting to, they've been in color and now they're starting to drop their leaves. The next windstorm, they're all going to be kind of naked. Uh, your Bradford pears or ornamental pears, they're still green. They're starting to show a hue of red to them. The oaks are just a hue of red and they'll bloom or not bloom. They'll, they'll, have, they'll be in color for the next two, three weeks. But by the middle of November, this is when your evergreens really anchor you in and, and keep you looking good. Without enough evergreens, your landscape looks too lunar, too too dusty, too too much rock. So you need some core types of, of spruce and pine and fir and junipers and cypress and cedars. There's a whole series. And those are just the trees. There's euonymus and cut and cotoneasters and heavenly bamboos. And there's all these varieties of shrubs that go with them. There's a lot of evergreens to choose from that can be planted right now. In fact, it's an ideal time to plant so you can see visually, huh, I want to look out my bay window and go, I want to see, I want to decorate that tree for the holidays and put twinkle lights on it. Wouldn't that be cute? or in a container right there by the front door or back patio or deck. I want to decorate that with some bows and have something festive for the holidays. If ever there was a season, this is the year, the COVID year. We've been outdoors and it's been fresh air. It's been, it felt, felt good. It was exercise. It, it was inspirational, added oxygen and exercise. Um, indoors, You'll need to be strategic with that. You'll want to have some things to nurture inside your house. In fact, that's going to be next week's show is succulents. We've got a whole series of, of really freaky, cute, neat, just unusual succulents. These are cactus without the spines. That's a succulent. And there's a bunch of them that grow indoors as houseplants. I'm not going to spoil or alert or go over that now, but this is when you start to Holiday plants have this may be the year to invest in a new Christmas tree to decorate in your in your living room. This is to let's let's decorate and feel good about our insides like we've been on our patios, decks, and outsides. And I think your bay windows, your key windows, your entrance, your exits, your those doors, especially where the glass is, where you can look out and see something beautiful. It almost extends your living room out into the yard, although you're inside sipping hot tea and, you know, watching the sunset, watching it snow or whatever. I do still have some snow on my back patio. We've got a two-story house. It's, you know, overlooking the dells. It, it's a great house, but that north side, it's all shade. And so when it's cold, it stays cold. These types of evergreens, they're fine with that. So my euonymus, it looks great out there. It's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, camellias, 
loves the shade, evergreen. It's budding up nicely. It, it just thrives in there. I've got a, a gardenia. It's been in bloom, and of course now with the cold, it's no longer blooming, but it's evergreen. And so it just holds me, holds it together. So when I look out those windows where the TV room is, I kind of go, ah, you know, it might be a little messy with some leaves, but I could blow those off. But look at the containers. They just look so good. And so it extends my, my, it extends my beauty out into the yard. I can look at that from the windows and back and forth. I guess the negative to that is, here's another reason for evergreens. Now that the trees have dropped their leaves, <laughs> this is when you don't want to see your, your neighbor in their bay window looking at you and your bay window. That's where you need some evergreens to kind of block that and to kind of have some privacy. This is when you see the weaknesses in your privacy. So you've been outdoors in the hot tub and on the back patio with the grills and you know the aspens have been up and they've given you this this private public space where you can go outdoors and just enjoy it. Well, now it's kind of chilly. Maybe out during the day you can enjoy that, but truly we're starting to bring indoors our gardening. This is when your house plants, your holiday plants. So we're getting our first shipment of Christmas cactus in. So it's part of that succulent line. We're getting ready for next next week's uh, radio show. And so that's part of that series, Amaryllis, uh, your, your African violets, of course, all your traditional peace lilies and dr dracaenas. This is when your indoor gardens really carry you out. And most houses, quite honestly, they don't have enough plants indoors. It feels, yes, you got a brand new sofa. I might even have some new art on the wall, but the, the plants help it feel more homey. Like there's something living, breathing in the room with you and your new puppy dog. Uh, you need, it's just, you need, you need more of that in our house. And this is the year I think to really invest in that, whether it's a new Christmas tree, more decorations. Did you notice that Christmas lights went up sooner this year than ever I've seen? Like uh, it was Halloween over and boom, just like that, the lights were turned on. And, and I think folks are wanting to decorate and get that feeling of family and holiday and togetherness, uh, they need that in our homes. And so we're seeing that play out. Snow. Now, it looks like we've got some real nice weather coming, but this is how it'll be. It'll be a real cold front, then it will warm back up. Then there'll be another light dusting of snow, then it'll warm back up. Uh, so it just does this ebb and flow, and it's the altitude that does this to us. Your evergreen plants, they like that. They live in that. They're, they're okay with that. In fact, if ever there was a good, this is a great time. If you could have plant a new spruce tree, a new pine tree out in your yard and have it snow afterwards, that is the best moisture for your landscape if, if, of any because it, it, it lights on that landscape and then it slowly melts down and gets down, permeates into the root zone. So it's the best kind of really hydrating moisture that you can give to your landscape. Your evergreens really like that. Likewise, if you've not fertilized your landscape, let's say you've got an established landscape, snow is such a, such a, it's so advantageous. It just does so much good for you. If you can throw fertilizer on top of snow, as that snow melts, or as it drizzles, or as it sleets, or as it just, it, during a weather front, it takes that fertilizer, breaks it down, and slowly pushes it down in around that root zone. It is the best way to get plant foods down into where the plants can actually absorb it. Of course, the best would be you put your fertilizer on, and then you had a weather event. But snow is just so good for a, a high-altitude winter landscape. I can't. I don't have enough time to care. I wanted to cover vegetables, flowers, especially the old tomatoes, peppers, things that have, don't leave that stuff out there. Let me leave that for another segment because I can go a little bit deeper on that, on the benefits, the pros, the cons. You don't want to leave those gardens untouched until next spring. There's some things you need to do to get, get ready so that you can kill off any spores, any bugs. You want to expose those gardens to the cold and the environment that's coming. But I'll go into that maybe at the bottom of the hour. Uh, we've got Lisa Waters coming in. Lisa Waters Lane, my wife. She comes in with your garden questions. That's the next segment. So let me bump out here. We'll be right back after these important messages. 
You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters October companion plants that grow well together are burning bush, spicy mums, glamour kale, and red fox sedge. Fox sedge has striking clumps of red foliage that fades to flocks, giving off a warm glow. An attractive foliage effect in container gardens, perennial beds, and fountain accents. A good choice in poor draining pockets along dry stream beds and beside large landscape boulders. You'll find foxy red grasses, just $17, here at Waters Garden Center. Google, give me directions to Waters Garden Center. Gardening has always come natural to me. Green thumbs, they just run in the family. So when the Family Garden Center was offered to Lisa and I, we jumped on the opportunity. I've always loved coming to the nursery, being surrounded by all the beauty, helping the backyard gardener and passing on some of that natural magic that happens so easily for me. We aren't just selling plants, we're offering garden success. My name is Ken Lane, owner, and you'll feel the magic here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes in each week with your garden questions. What are your neighbors talking about? And sometimes if you don't know the right question to ask... You just listen in. You can learn. And so that's what this segment's all about. So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. Always good to be here. It is good to be here. <laughs> it's good to be alive. Do you still love coming to work every day? Most days. Most days. <laughs> <laughs> this, the COVID thing got us a little off grid yeah. a couple times, but you know, it's still, it was good. No, it was good. The team I stuck together. I no, mean, we have a great team. We work well together. Everybody pitches in. So definitely can't complain. We had a couple of the younger folks, as soon as they heard, you know, this is back in March, April, mm-hmm. where they just went, I'm so scared. They, We kind of hire folks that are sort of garden, tree hug, nature. <laughs> we have the certain garden center genre, which we love. Uh, some of them said, I'm out of here. They went in the woods, and I don't think we've seen them back yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're okay I and do doing too. well and but most surviving. Folks- stayed here we're, we're noted mm-hmm. as the place where our employees put their roots down so we really don't have a lot of turnover mm-hmm. here at the staff we like to work together it's a yeah. pleasant place to be i think that's part of being a, a family business you're just part of the family mm-hmm. when when you have a true uh family either that or it's complete dysfunction <laughs> you see, we're not that we're not we're that. not dysfunctional <laughs> uh, so anyway garden questions yeah. What do we got? What are people asking about? What are they talking about? Well, definitely the winter. Winter yeah, has come. Yeah, that was... cold weather, that cold snap we got gave us some questions. Yeah. So first one is from Diane. She had some recently planted green giant arborvitaes. Uh, she noticed some browning out or and more unusual coloring on them after that last cold snap. So she just wants to know, should she be worried? Is that kind of a normal thing for that particular plant? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And I'm glad she's in tune with, with watching what's going on with her plants. That's tremendous. So a lot of evergreens are not truly evergreen. <gasps> they, keep the, <laughs> no, they keep their foliage but sometimes that foliage can turn colors. Mm-hmm. And so some of your junipers, they can turn from blue to green or purple or grays. or And they come back and they go back into this blue color. Uh, Arborvitas can be that way. They can go from this light Kelly green to what she's describing. So it doesn't surprise me at all mm-hmm. that it doesn't worry me. I'm not alarmed going, oh, my arborvita is a little off color. I'm going... It's probably just this winter color, and you're perfectly fine. The secret is make sure, this is especially important for evergreens, make sure you're watering that evergreen at least twice a month. Mm -hmm. Don't overdo it. Give it a deep soak. Well, Ken, how much should I water? You water it just like you would in April, May, June, the hottest day of summer. The, the, The amount of water you give plants is always the same always consistent what varies is the frequency how often do you do it and so a couple times a month and this last storm we had we had some weather 
Um, it wasn't enough moisture to oh, no. spit on plants. It was you might as well think of it as no moisture whatsoever. So it's just a non non event. I would say if you have at least an inch of rain in winter or at least six inches of snow, they equate about six inches of snow equates to about an inch of moisture. Then you could cut back one of those waterings, but otherwise keep them hydrated because evergreens, especially at this elevation, they're always using moisture. They, they don't truly shut down like they do other parts of the country. Here they're still actively growing, which is why it's so great to plant some of your bigger evergreens this time of year, even arbovita. So mm-hmm. that's that's it. So a lot of people say to me, but it's the ground is going to freeze. What happens if I water and it freezes? Plants don't care. Yeah. They don't. It's fine. And yeah, it might freeze. So here, Prescott, we're at, our house is at 5,700 feet. Yeah, maybe it will freeze. I think our ground froze like a half an inch. <laughs> and then it thawed like the next morning. So yeah, it freezes, but no, really not. Really, if you're worried about that, insulate your soil with a layer of composted mulch. And so that's why we say, it's, this is a month ago, this is our, our October things to do list. Mm-hmm. We said, put a put a two, three inch layer of, of mulch over your flower beds, around your roses, your trees. So it keeps that ground from freezing. Otherwise you can get heaving. So the ground freezes, thaws, freezes, thaws, free, and, and you'll see the ground get real fluffy. So it's really important, I would say, uh, if, if you've got uh, flower beds, things, raised beds, Insulate that. Mm-hmm. Uh, give, put your put your organic matter on there now, so it doesn't do damage to the root that top layer of roots later. Okay, alrighty. Well, John has a question. He has a spruce that's about six years old or so. It's definitely leaning to one side. <laughs> Wants to know: Is there a way to straighten those at this point in its life? A uh, six-year-old tree. Could you buy a six by six piece of timber from your local hardware or lumber yard and try to bend it? (laughs) The answer is, yeah, you could try. (laughs) The answer is no. Uh, All you can do now is that type of tree naturally grows straight up. So if it's starting to lean, that's a wind issue. It should have been staked six years ago uh, to keep it from leaning. And so now it's too late. What you can do now is you know it's going to grow and grow. It's going to try to correct and grow into or up to the moon Mm -hmm. straight up. So fertilize, 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 fertilize a lot. Fertilize four times a year. Fertilize. Really get the growth on that. So when it does start to grow, it naturally corrects itself and then fills in. It might be another six years before you actually get it to where it looks good. But you can do this. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's so critical when you're adding trees, whether it's an evergreen tree, uh, it starts to lean. And evergreens were staking so that if the snow load comes, and it will, it doesn't load up. These evergreens, let's say a nice spruce tree or pine tree, you can get 50, 100 pounds of snow on this little tree, and it starts to lean or mm-hmm. fall over. This is really important for Arizona cypress or cedars, junipers. Um, your your deciduous trees, those things that lose their leaves, like the shade trees, fruit trees, those you stake because they leaf out in spring when that prevailing southwest wind, that spring wind, while it's pushing this new growth, pushes on it all the time, nonstop, day and night. And so all of a sudden this tree starts to lean on you. So you're staking it so that it, until it solidifies, till those tree rings start to grow and, and then it braces itself against the against the wind. Usually that takes one year really small tree, maybe two years. Mm-hmm. Then they're fully rooted. They've, they've really kind of solidified. They've actually become rigid, and now they can protect themselves. Okay. Good to know. All right. So it's kind of like <laughs> root problem day. Yeah. So uh, David had, a, he thought it was a fairly mature uh, Vanderwolf pine out in his yard. With that last wind, his tree just went bloop right oh, over. Really? Interesting. So his question is, why didn't it have the root? I mean, what, why would it just blow over that easy? And is there, if he reprops it up, stakes it again, what are the odds of it surviving? So th- those are great questions. So that's a, that's a soil issue. So Vanderwolf pines like soil that drains really well. 
So it could be a couple things. I'm not quite sure. I'd have to see the roots or get, bring a picture in. Or get, show. Definitely set it back up. Mm-hmm. It will reroot. Uh, you definitely want to stake it or it will fall back over again. Now, why did it do that after how many years was that thing in the ground? He didn't give me an exact. Oh, gotcha. just said he thought it was fairly mature. Oh, okay. Whatever that gotcha. means. So um, if it's bumping up against a rock shelf, uh, it won't root. If the hole that you dug, you're planting in solid granite, the tree's only going to grow to as much soil as you chipped out this rock, and then it stops. And so you get bigger and bigger and bigger. The tree gets more wind shear mass, and it just has, doesn't have enough roots. It falls right over. So it's usually a soil issue. When you prop it back up, if you can, dig a hole around, loosen the soil and add some mulch around the outer edge of that root ball. Really fertilize it. And then give it some root and grow. We make our own composted tea uh, that helps it reroot. It's going to have to reroot, but I would give it that at least two, three, four times in the winter. And then next spring, do it again a couple times so we can get those root masses to really extend and grow out again. Uh, but if it looks good and it didn't snap off, prop her back up and she'll grow again. So don't don't you know nurture it along. It'll grow. Great question, though, on Vanderwolf Pines. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners will be right back after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Waters October companion plants that grow well together are blaze maples, spicy mums, glamour kale, and burning bush. Waters Compact Burning Bush is a neat, well-behaved shrub prized for its blazing red foliage in the fall. Looks great when planted with autumn gold sumacs, lilacs, and gold euonymus. At six foot, this bush makes a natural hedge that burns red through autumn, all for $49. You'll find the showiest shrubs here at Waters Garden Center. Siri, give me directions to Waters Garden Center. You might say I've been part of the local garden scene even before birth. My father started the very first garden center in northern Arizona and ran the family business with my mother, even while she was pregnant. The nursery was my preschool, with many joyous after-school hours spent playing in the family business. Waters isn't just a garden center. It's a safe place for kids and pets alike. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. So that was, what is it, a week, two weeks ago? Anyway, it's... There was a cold front that came through, some weather hit. I've got a little bit of dusting of snow, a little bit left of that, that weather event in my backyards, my gardens. But all of my plants that were tropical, you know, the basils, the tomatoes, all those summer-loving, heat-loving plants, they died. If I didn't bring them indoors, they are, they're out of here. They did not like that 20-degree weather. And so they vaporized. They just turned brown, black. They just, they just are sitting there in your gardens – do not leave those plants in the ground. Clean it up. You want those gardens. So all of my containers that had those kind of plants have been, all those plants have been taken out. The vegetable raised beds I have, those have all been cleaned up. Now I've not prepped the soil yet. What I want to do is get all those old plants from last growing season out of there so it exposes the sun, exposes the the earth, exposes that garden area to the cold. We want the cold to permeate down through there and just kill off any viruses or bacterias or cutworms or insects or pill bugs or earwigs. The cold is not kind to those kinds of insects and bugs. So we want to expose that ground open. If you leave a bunch of foliage on top of that, it's almost like insulation. It keeps the ground from getting cool. It keeps the ground from freezing. And so you want to get rid of those old tomatoes. You want to clear out that old geranium. Get rid of those zinnias. Open that up. 
expose the ground, expose the garden so that it can get cold. This is important for next spring's garden. If you just take a tomato plant and there's some things that happen, some leaf spot, uh, there's some blacks, black leaves, some yellow leaves, there's some curling, vertinillum wilt. There's some things that eat tomato plants and they're usually viral. You don't see them. You don't see the bug, but it's still, there's something there eating the leaves. Get rid of that plant. If there's any kind of blemish on that vegetable plant, especially tomatoes, especially, especially tomatoes, um, get that out of there and don't compost it. Throw it in the dumpster. Get it off your property. Burn it. Add it to the burn pile, but don't keep it, don't keep it around. And then expose that area underneath that tomato plant to the cold, to the winter. So you'll be planting again next April. You'll probably get your soils ready by January, actually anytime you want. But really, we kind of take a break now. We're you know, it's gardening, kind of tired. I want to have a break. I want to get my first seed catalog. You know, they're coming. They'll be here in the next couple of weeks. I want to be inspired. I want to think through and go, oh, yeah. I do want a garden like that again. I do. Oh, I want to try that. Oh, look at that. That's neat. I'm going to try that seed or get this plant. And then usually we're prepping our soils after the new year, after we've put on that, you know, holiday 10 pounds. Um, and all of a sudden the belt buckles a little bit tighter. I just need to get outdoors and do something. That's when we're usually, you know, double turning our soil, adding some manures and compost. You literally, if you're a, if you're an overachiever, you can do that you know, pull those plants out and do it now. But my rhythm, this is what I do. Maybe I'm just sharing this. This is Gardner. My name's Ken. We're just friends. Here's what I do and, and why. <laughs> but the main point is don't leave those old flowers in that flower bed. If it's an old summer flower, it's okay to plant pansies. So we've sold, I don't know how many cartloads of winter pansies, violas, snapdragons, Dusty Miller. There's a whole series of plants that like the cold, and they're okay with that. They like the frost. They like snow. You can plant those in there, but but don't. I, I see too many mistakes from rookie gardeners. They're tired. They're indoors. They're kind of chilled. They're going. Oh, I got to put a vest or, or a jacket on. I'm not going outside. And they they leave those plants there, and then they go come in. They plant their. They get their next set of tomato starts, and they plug them in the same exact spot. And they just clear that old foliage out. They, they put the new one in and the same disease they were fighting last year is right back at them. The secret is open up that earth and allow it to be chilled. Allow it, expose it to the cold, to the weather that's coming. And that will kill off those insects and disease that, are, that, that were on there last year, usually. That's also a reason you're crop rotating. You don't plant your petunias in the same spot every single time. There's some, there's some disease things that happen to petunias, and it's, and it's harbored in the soil. If you put your petunias there every time, the same soil, the same diseases come back. You really want to put geraniums there next time. Put your petunias over here, the other side of the bed. So you're always crop rotation. You're moving your potatoes. You're moving your tomatoes. You're moving your peppers. You're moving your corn to different spots. Each year, you're growing a little bit different spot. That way, if there is a disease that gets on those, then they, they don't come back and get right back on the same kind of plants. Insects, viruses, bacterias, they have their favorite foods as well. And so they're going to go back to that plant. If it's planted right there with them, they're, they're going to go, oh, this is great. I remember this. Let's do it again. Vroom. And they're right back on your eggplant or on your squash or on your zinnias, on your petunias, whatever it is. It's important to crop rotation and then clean up that old, don't let frosted material stay there in the gardens. Cleanliness is next to godliness, at least when it comes to gardening. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Water's October companion plants that grow well together are blaze maple, burning bush, Arizona creeper, spicy mums, and glamour kale. Few flowers are more elegant in fall than water's glamour kale. The autumn colors are perfect for containers, beds, and borders. And it's so easy to grow. This unique Prescott selection is an award winner for cold hardiness, intense red, purple flowers in a frilly package, all for $9. You'll find bright fall flowers here at Waters Garden Center. 
in Prescott. If life is a bowl of cherries, why not make them the biggest, sweetest cherries ever? Waters Garden Center is super excited to introduce our new organic fruit and vegetable plant food. This fertilizer has the bonus of added calcium that gives fruit trees and veggies an extra boost to produce healthy, abundant crops. Feed your plants now to help them thrive and grow more fruits than ever in just $27 for a 20-pound bag. Save natural, organic, fruit and vegetable plant food only at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. We are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week to share her garden tips, her garden advice. What is she seeing with customers, local gardeners, and her personal gardens? And so we just, uh, I think there's a wealth of knowledge there in her head, that beautiful, beautiful head. Well, thank you. That we can share. <laughs> I actually can't wait. Right after the show, we are heading to El Paso, Texas. Woohoo! Gonna go visit the grandkids. Yeah, <laughs> and then we're heading over to Austin, Texas, which we've got our oldest daughter lives there. Mm-hmm. Visit her and her husband, and, and their dog come, Tippy, and her dog, her granddaughter, our grand dog, <laughs> and then uh, come back home visit our son, who has been in training. I think over near some place, the deserts of California, like yes. Barstow. Mm-hmm. They took now he's in uh, he's at Fort Bliss. This is firm, first armored division. This is where all the tanks are. He's in the army. And so he's been out. They've just been doing maneuvers, training, training, training. So he's been gone for a month. So we're going to come back. He comes home on the 21st and visit with him, celebrate, and then we'll come back home on yeah. the 22nd. While he was out there training, he became a captain. Yeah. So now he's Captain James Lane. Has That's good pretty awesome. To it. That sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> Captain James Lane. Like, I guess the only thing better would be Captain Kirk. If you're a Star Trek, if you're a Trekkie, you Trekkies know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, I it thought Picard get much. was better. <laughs> so, garden gardening. We should go back to gardening, <laughs> not, not Trek Star Trek. Uh, what do you got for us? Enlighten us. Ooh, I will. Do you know how Sesame Street is? is this show was brought to you by the letter L yeah. and the number seven. Well, this show is brought to you by the color. Yellow. Oh, very good. So I think last week or the week before, I've kind of lost track. I was talking about uh, things in the uh, plants in the yard that give you color in their berries. So red berries, orange berries. We talked about red. So this one's yellow. Things that not don't bury yellow, but have yellow leaves to them or branching to them that um, definitely give you great color this time of year out in that yard. Things are looking kind of kind of gray. Kind of brown. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Things have gone to sleep, for sure. Most things have gone to sleep. So it's great to have some color out there. And and yellow, most people kind of go, yellow, why do I want yellow out in my yard? But it really shows up. So if you're enjoying your yard from your kitchen window, from your uh, covered patio, if you're just looking at your bedroom windows this time of year, there's not a lot going on. That yellow really shows up and really brings a lot of sunshine into your life. Ooh, I like the sound of that. So these are mainly evergreen kind of foliage mm-hmm. yellows yes. or, or bloom yellows. Like forsythia is blooms in the spring well, yellow, but it's twiggy is right now. true. But these are things that are evergreen with yellow in them. Gotcha. Well, yellow golds mm-hmm. look so good against our natural blues. We have Arizona, is a, there are natural colors just like blue. The, mm-hmm. the, the, the junipers are blue. The Arizona cypress are blue. The oaks are blue. So put gold up against that. Oh, it's very, very just pretty. a design cell, yeah. Yeah. So we'll start with the short guys first. The shortest being the moon shadow, you want to This gets about two by five. Uh, very has that yellow and green leaf. It's just very dynamic, very full, great little ground cover for certain spots in the yard. Um, wonderful little plant to use. Not necessarily deer and rabbit resistant, yeah, but yeah. not everybody has those issues. That's right. Yeah, sometimes you got your backyard or a container <laughs> yeah. or something. You oh, they do in. really well in yeah. container up on a porch. So that's kind of one of those shorter ones. The emerald and gold euonymus has a little bit smaller leaf. Um, it gets a really pretty winter color to it as well. So most of the year, it's that 
emerald and gold. But it also gets almost a pink, uh, light pink, peachy color to it yeah. in the wintertime. So it just makes it really pretty to have more color out there, even in the wintertime. Now, when it gets like two by five, somewhere in there, I'd say. Uh, gold spot euonymus. So these are all kind of euonymus right now. It's one of the most famous <laughs> golds. There's a couple <laughs> natives that are gold like that too. Right. So gold spot has a uh, green on the outside of its leaf with the yellow in the center of the leaf. So uh, you're seeing a lot of green with splotches of, of the gold. Very, very pretty. It's five by four. Five, five yeah. by six, yeah, chest somewhere tires, in there. Yeah. Makes a really good hedge if you're looking for a hedge. Uh, screening plants if you don't need something really tall, but you just need to block something shorter off. Electrical boxes, that type yeah. of thing. Works wonderfully for that. Uh, then there's gold euonymus. <laughs> and the one about that is it has, it's the opposite. So it has the yellow on the outside and the green on the inside of the leaf. It is definitely, definitely more gold. Yeah. You know, if you put the two by side by side, if you like that gold, boy, go for the golden euonymus because it really shows that. And that one there again, about five by five. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Nice little hedger. Silver King, which isn't maybe necessarily gold, but it's creamy. <laughs> it's a cream. It's a butter gold. <laughs> it's a butter gold there. <laughs> so I threw that one in because it's pretty too. Uh, and it gets a little bit Bigger, I believe, probably more of six by six. Yeah, head high there. edge. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then gilt edge silverberry. So this one's really nice if you like that yellow color of some of the euonymuses, but you have a lot of deer. The silverberry um, Eliagnus is very deer resistant. So if you've got those critters coming in, but you like that look. Go for the uh, silverberry. It's got a little bit more nativey mm -hmm. look to it. It is a native. It's related to a native that right. goes wild out there. But uh, so the animals don't. They know. Don't eat this. Don't this is going to be bad. And it's uh, pretty drought hardy once very, it's established yeah. and kind of takes care of itself. Just a real nice one. The bright star yucca. Now a lot of people are familiar with our red yuccas and the big yuccas. Bright Star is um, it's a yellow and green variegated yucca. It gets probably two, one to two feet tall. Yeah. Um, it will put off little side yuccas too, so it gets about two, three feet wide. Uh, really pretty. In fact, I've just put one over here in front of your, your office. It's beautiful. Because I wanted to try and it. And the Havilina have left it alone they so have far. They left yep. it alone so yep. far. So fingers crossed, knock on wood. Hopefully they never see it. I have it surrounded by gopher spurge, <laughs> <laughs> which they don't like. The, the uh, gophers are, uh, the uh, Havilina are thick mm -hmm. uh, in front of the office. So just every night they start ravaging everything. So if you want to know what's Havilina proof, <laughs> we know. <laughs> we know. We can definitely tell you. Um, the Sea of Gold Juniper is another one that I really like. We have that in our yard at home, personally, and which is really nice because it backyard faces north so it's it kind of dark out yeah. there in the winter just kind of doldrums so having that pop of yellow out there is is really attractive we top dress our with uh some darker you know mulch mm -hmm. shredded bark kind of stuff see the gold with that darker ground cover kind of stuff it just really highlights the backyard mm -hmm, definitely if you want to go taller I do. there is a golden deodora cedar which is really I think it's a gorgeous tree for the yard, especially if you have a smaller yard and you can't put a 50-foot Deodor yeah. cedar in it. <laughs> um, the golden is great because it gets up 20 max, 25 feet tall, 10 to 15 feet wide. So perfect for those smaller yards or um, up against those those brick walls that a lot of people have out in their yards. It would be wonderful out in there. It's just like a Deodor cedar only. The new growth is gold. Mm -hmm. Stunning, actually. Big swooping soft branches, yeah. central leaders straight up. Looks like a Christmas tree mm -hmm. in gold. In fact, if you were to put like gold, uh, white twinkle, twinkle lights, lights in it, it, that would be, I want to be the holidays. I'm in. <laughs> I want to hear Christmas music. You I'm, all, I'm all ready. <laughs> so if you have a shady spot, but looking for something gold for your shady spots, the Goshiki Holly or false holly. It's sometimes called very, very pretty. Goshiki means like five colors. So it's kind of yellow, but it's got pinks and greens and all that kind of mixed in. Very attractive. And then a new one, that I think it's the first time we've carried this one called Drops of Gold. It's a holly. Um, so parts of it are very dark, that dark green holly, but it doesn't have that 
uh, pointy leaf to it. It's kind yeah, of a rounder yeah. uh, leaf to it, but it also has very bright gold leaves on it. Does it have red berries as well? You see it that is or? a female, so it's it does female. not gotcha. produce the berries. Gotcha. So it'll need a pollinator to really get that going if you're going to have the berries. See so that right. gold? Just hollies mm-hmm. in a container. Not even, Just take it home in the grower's pot. Put it by the front door. Right. It just screams happy holidays. Happy uh, Merry holidays. Christmas. Uh, yep. It just is beautiful. Great. So this segment's been brought to you by the color yellow. Is that how we started that? It is. (laughs) So thank you, Lisa. Uh, Gold evergreens you can put out in the yard in your landscape right now and enjoy throughout the winter. Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Waters October companion plants that grow well together are burning bush, Arizona creeper, spicy mums, glamour kale, and Prescott blaze maple. Prescott blaze maples have extreme growth of three feet or more each year. The fall color glows like embers in a blaze hot fire. Thus the name. There's no better red maple to plant locally. Perfect for patios or any place shade is needed. And a big, bold tree is just $149. You'll find the best fall shade trees here at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-home garden consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. So we were coming off of uh, the election cycle. And it just, you can feel this, oh, it's over with, finally. So I was writing this week's garden column going, what can I write that's not political? I never mention politics. In fact, I like both parties. I think they're like guardrails. If any one goes off the deep end, the other party kind of brings them back. It's kind of like a road, a curvy road. They just kind of keep you in line. So we need both. I'm, I'm not pro or con or either one. But optimism. What is optimism? The definition is hopefulness or confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. So how can I tie that into gardening? Well, the alternate, you know, the alternate garden definition to optimism is one who plants seed or young plants with the faith it will grow into something better. That gardeners have optimism, let me tell you. Plants naturally take optimism, hope, faith to believe in their potential, to see positive outcomes, to nurture your garden, I think is good for the soul. There is more, something satisfying to the sheer act of gardening. I, I've helped so many people through this COVID season that, that stepped into a garden center. They came to Waters, and I, I just witnessed. You can just see their their demeanor. gets. It's a healing power of a store full of, full of plants. So I, I, I like to think of Waters Garden Center as a center for optimism. That's sort of how I, I started out this week's garden column. Ultimately, it's on succulents. We got a whole shipment of funky, freaky succulents that came in. Some of them have warts. Some of them are baseball size. Some of them are blobs in it. They're just cute. I mean, you just look at them and go, whoa, that's a plant. God created that. You got to be kidding me. That, I want one of those. So succulents are just kind of fun plants that you can have indoors. Many varieties can go outdoors too, but these were all indoor houseplant kind of things. I went, oh, this is so fun. I'll talk about those. And how could I set the stage? Optimism. I think you gardeners, if you're tuned into a garden, a garden program at the end, I mean, we're right before Thanksgiving. And you're listening to garden program, that says something about you. You're you're like a you're a garden nerd. 
or you just like the sound of my voice. I don't think it's that one. I think you're a garden nerd. And so there's some fun things that you can do. And I also think you're an optimist. You just go through life nurturing something that's beyond yourself going, I can make this grow. I can make a seed come up, a bulb emerging from the earth. Something magical about that. Something that's that's not so magical. The deer and, and rabbits have just, there's the poor things. The drought has really got them in a desperate state. And so the wildlife out in the forest is, they're eating things we've never seen them eat before. It's just they're, they're, they're starving. And they're going, well, I can't eat my normal grass that I like because it's all dried up. I think I'll go eat this Eliagnus or this Euonymus or you, the, the, this person's landscape. I'm going to try it because I'm just hungry. And so we're seeing a lot of that. I thought it was, I'd spend just a moment and just share a few plants that I, I know the animals will not eat, especially the deer and javelina. And, and so I've got deer. I've got both. But rabbits seem to come into the backyard, which is fenced, but they come underneath and they come to the water. They come to the pond, the water features. They're, they're hydrating because there's a drought on. And so if I put the wrong thing back there, they are going to just eat it to the ground. And so I won't go over the plants they'll eat. I'll go over the plants they don't eat. And I always start with the natives and the herbs. Herbal plants, things that smell uh, interesting. If you and I like the smell of the flavor, animals don't. There's something about fragrance. It's a defense that plants put into themselves going, if there's a fragrance, I'm going to make your stomach turn. I'm going to make you sick. You don't want to eat me. Keep moving and eat the next thing. This is a plant, the way they've developed and, and as natural defenses, rosemary has got this rosemary flavor to it. Now, we use it in the kitchen, but animals know if you smell that, stay away because you can't eat very much or it'll make you sick. Lavenders the same way. Oregano, thyme. There's a whole series of plants. You can plant chives, onions. These are all plants. You could plant onions right now. They're beautiful. Uh, they're not going to bother those. Arugula. You go right. Most herbs have this potent fragrance that we use to flavor things or as potpourris or, uh, but, but animals know, nope, not, that's not good for me. Likewise, a lot of your natives have been trained. Now, Native plants are, are growing wild out where these animals are naturally roaming around. So they already know, oh, don't, like, don't like that one. Keep moving because I've seen that one. We're going to keep moving on till we find something we want to devour. I'd rather go for that rose bush than eat this Eliagnus or silverberry. This is a native evergreen shrub. Gets about head high um, it, and, and wide. It's kind of big, bald, evergreen plant. And it's got a fragrance to it, and it's got a texture. The back of the leaf is very leathery. Uh, it's got a, even it's got multiple defenses. The sap is bad. The leaf is very thick and rough, and the back of the leaf has a white, uh, like like a like a fluffy, powdery thing that gets caught in your throat. If you eat that, you're kind of going, oh, oh, that's that's terrible stuff. Oh. Keep moving on. You need plants like that. That uh, animals will just, they just know, this is not good. I tried this when I was a youngster, and I don't like this. One that's unusual is Nandina, or heavenly bamboo. This looks beautiful. It's a nice little evergreen. Comes a couple different sizes. I just planted a whole bunch of, of Gulf Stream, G-U-L-F, G-U-L-F, Gulf Stream Nandina. Um, it's an evergreen shrub. Gets up about hip high or so, maybe a little lower. Nice ball shaped thing, but it's beautiful, lacy, soft, green leaves. Animals don't like that, and I think it's the sap. It's got an internal taste that that just repels the animals. But likewise, snapdragons. It's a cute little. It's almost a perennial. It reseeds very nicely. It's like a wildflower, uh, but animals don't like that because of the sap. It's got a white milky sap to it that just goes, hey, listen, you know I'm going to make you sick if you try to eat this. Keep moving on. And, and they do keep moving on. And so there's a whole series of plants, Mahonia or Oregon grape. That's another native variety. It just grows out there in the forest. And animals just know, oh, when you see this, 
I think it's the sap again. They don't like the taste. It's got a real thick, leathery leaf to it, so it's hard to digest. And then it tastes bad. That's a double whammy. It gets a cute little um, yellow flower in the spring that does really great. And then it puts on a little berry. The berry actually is edible, but the foliage and the rest of the plant is not. So animals just walk by it like it was nothing. They don't want it. Uh, so those, generally speaking, also your junipers. You notice we have natural juniper forest. And animals know, I don't like juniper. It's got a fragrance and it's got a pokey texture to it that they just don't like. So they'll keep moving on. Arizona cypress, same way. They don't like that. So you can plant those right out there where deer are roaming around and they will not munch on it. Now, let me get rid of the juniper myth as well. So junipers... They come in male and female form. Everyone goes, oh, I get allergies. Oh, my gosh. I can't plant a juniper. Yeah, you can. They're natural. They're native. They adapt really well. They're low water, low care. Animals don't eat them. Every yard needs at least two or three junipers. But you want the females, not the males. The males are the ones that put on the pollen. The males are the ones that cause all the issues. They have all the allergies. The females don't have pollen. They don't have allergies. They put on the berries to them. So when we're breeding, when we're growing junipers here at the garden center, we're looking for a grower that has a genetic, an exact copy of a female. So we don't have all the allergy issues. So it won't be a messy juniper. It'll be a clean, neat juniper, and it's not going to give you allergies. And quite honestly, if you have allergies to junipers, you're surrounded by juniper forests. There's no hope. I mean, a whole hillsides, the whole thing is there's a dust covering every, the entire city. It's filled with this, with the males. They just want to pollinate everything. And so, one little golden juniper that's knee high, spreading out knee wide, is not going to cause you any grief. That's not your problem. But they're so hardy. And deer, javelina, rabbits, everything leaves a juniper alone. They're just natural. They're great plants for the high-altitude landscapes that we're dealing with here in northern Arizona. Got more in store for you, but got to take a break. Be right back after this. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Waters companion plants that grow well together are blaze maple, burning bush, spicy mums, glamour kale, and red wall creeper. Waters red wall creeper is specially selected to dress up those miles of stockade fence. A mountain vine with rich green foliage turns fire engine red through autumn. Waters native vines are just $49 and both deer and rabbit proof. You'll find the showiest vines here at Waters Garden Center. Google, give me directions to Waters Garden Center. Wondering why the grass is always greener on the other side? Well, it's probably because your neighbor used the all-purpose fertilizer from Waters Garden Center. Monsoon is right around the corner, and it's the perfect time to feed your plants. Waters all-purpose fertilizer is the only organic made especially for Arizona mountain soils. Don't buy a bunch of different fertilizer for your flowers, veggies, trees, or grass. This one does it all. The plants on your side will be happier, healthier, well, greener. Safe, natural, organic. Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. So it it looks like what we were fearing is going to happen. So this whole COVID thing, you know, Utah's all shut down. We're starting to see this big bubble wave starting to happen. Um, it, it, outdoors, fresh air is good for you. Take a walk in the forest. This this thing can't live in the cold. It can't live out in the sun. It's very delicate, but inside it can. So I, I, I'm planting a few more plants inside my house because plants have a way of absorbing dust and dirt and cleaning the air. I think freshness, vitality... Something living, breathe. House plants are important inside your house, but likewise outside, do something that will allow you to enjoy the outside. Plant some pansies. So you got something to clean up. They'll bloom all winter, but you can go out and just check on them, and you can get some fresh air. You can get outside. 
plant a new Christmas tree. Have something where you can decorate and go admire and watch the snow and just enjoy. Don't just come inside and go, gardening's over. That is not true. You can still be outside, do something healthy, fresh air, uh, sunlight. The things that we're famous for in the mountains of Arizona, I think you can keep doing that. So we are going to remain open. So Waters Garden Center, we we had the, did the whole COVID thing back in March, April, May, June till today. Never closed. Uh, thank goodness the the mayor and the governor both. So Mang- Mayor Mangarelli, which ultimately makes the calls for all business business in, in the city of Prescott at least, saw the value of garden centers. No matter how bad this thing gets, if you just need to get out. Not even if you're a gardener, you just want to bring your dog and walk amongst the plants and just get some fresh air. This is this is an invitation. Please, you're my friend. You're tuned into to our show. We would love to have you and just walk through and look at the plants and touch the pine trees and smell the spruce and watch something bloom. Uh, it's it's okay. I think we need reasons to be outdoors, and I think. The companies that have thought through this, where I wouldn't want to be a box, a big box. We we are an outdoor store. Something about being indoors is gonna. I mean, that just my head. I'm, I'm my guard's always up. Who's around me? Where's my bubble? How much space? Do they have masks? Do they not? I don't know. Uh, so I think outdoors is 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 good. I don't I don't know what we're gonna do with restaurants that kind of stuff. I'm personally gonna have. I just bought. I just here's what I'm doing. I have a battery-operated jacket. It has heater elements in it. So I can be outdoors more and, and not get cold. So I've, there's the new technology is amazing. So I got a vest and I got a jacket, both with heater elements in it for the front and the back. Kind of has one, one's got a heater coil in your neck up in the in the collar. Going, that's brilliant. We need to look for reasons to be outdoors. So, um, and you can still garden. It's not like you f- poor folks from the desert. You're going, oh no, it's under seventy degrees. I must go indoors and hibernate. No, that's not. That's not where we live. You can garden year round here. So you can enjoy the outdoors year round. You can be in the forest. You can you can enjoy the garden. You can walk the, around the, a lake, watch a view. Watch the eagles soar, uh, soar above a, a ridgeline. It just, it's, this is a great place to live. So no matter how bad this thing gets, and it looks like it's getting worse, um, don't be afraid. And, and get outdoors. Your gardens are your friend. And if you, if you need a space just to get out to, you're welcome to Waters Garden Center. The governor said we're essential. The mayor has said we're essential because of our because of the seed and the vegetable plants and the fruit trees, if you're going to eat from your yard, you need garden centers. And so they've, they're going to keep us open and we're going to remain open because I think it's important for our community to be out there. Anyway, I went off in a direction I wasn't really planning on, uh, but Ken and Lisa Lane, we're here throughout the week. We love talking to fans and friends of the show. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.